Hey, I'm Jeff Lynch, and I'm one of the pastors here at Compassion Church in beautiful Danville, Virginia. We love it that you have found us here online. Here's this week's message. Hey, a couple of things. If you came this morning uh, expecting game day, well, I can see why you would since we've told you for four weeks that today was going to be game day, right? Uh, well, we kind of blew that, but, but the reason that we're not doing the whole game day thing today is simply because, man, I'll just be honest with you, about, about half of our staff, we've got folks who have been really sick over the last week, and we just didn't have all of our team uh, to be available to be able to do those things. So we thought in the best interest of, of trying to do things with excellence, that it would be better for us to just postpone. So we've done that, and we're going to get our heads together as a staff over the next couple of days and decide, are we going to reschedule this thing? How are we going to do it? So stay tuned. We're, we, uh, we, we, we don't know where that's going just yet, but we'll be getting back to you soon on that. A um, couple of things before I get into the message. Every week we hand you a little outline, a bulletin, and on the, on the back side of it, some of you have looked at that every week, and I guess the same thing that was in there last week. Well, it is. It's the same things that's in there, but there are a couple of things that I want to make sure you guys know about. One of those is a discover class discover class. And so if you're someone who's been coming to compassion, maybe for a little while now, and you've never been to a compassion discover class, or maybe you've been coming for a long time and you haven't been to a Discover class. I want to encourage you to register for that class. Sign up for it. I want everybody in our church to go through the Discover class because it's a class that we take you through in a short amount of time and it tells you who we are, what our affiliations are, what we believe, uh, how we're governed, how there's oversight to things, and what you can expect by, by becoming a part of, of this place. So if you're considering making this place your home or if it already is, if you haven't been through Discover, uh, you can sign up for that today. It gives you information on the bulletin or there's a next steps card in front of you. You can do that. Also in that bulletin, there's a thing called a grow class. And I just want to hit this really quickly. Um, if you're someone who has recently said yes to Jesus and begun following him, we have a class that's called the grow class. And it's designed for people who are exploring baptism. If you want to know more about baptism, signing up for the class doesn't mean that you have to be baptized, but it will take you through the steps to get you ready. And if you choose to be baptized, that class will get everything ready. More than that, though, it will teach you over the course of a few weeks how it is that you can live out this thing of following Jesus. Um, the last thing I want to say is I just want to thank you to everyone who has signed up throughout this Bench Warmer series in August that we've been going through. So many of you have signed up uh, to volunteer in different areas of our church and kids ministry and students, and, and we see those volunteer numbers climbing and falling into place. And I just want to say thank you. Come on, give yourselves a big round of applause for everybody who's stepping into the call. So thankful for that. Well, today I want to talk to you from the title of a message that I'm calling, When I Feel Your Pain. When I Feel Your Pain. Um, last week, man, I was so proud of you. I was so proud of Compassion Church. You know, um, last Sunday at this time, we were just learning about the devastation that, that had taken place in Waverly, and you decided that we would do something about it. Y'all remember that last week? Man, it was kind of a crazy week. And so um, before the Sunday stories were starting to get back to us, we, we were already beginning to feel the pain that came from these floods in Waverly. And so, so Angela said it very well last week. She said, some of us are going to go, which is what happened. Some of us went. Some of us gave money. Some of us bought supplies. Y'all, when we rolled in here like 4 or 5 o'clock last Saturday, uh, last Sunday evening, we filled up the back of my pickup truck. We filled up the back of Steve Decker's truck. We even stuffed things into one of the shower stalls on the shower trailer that we hauled down here because y'all brought so much stuff. And y'all gave about $2,000 somewhere in that neighborhood to take to that group down there. Come on, give yourselves one more round of applause. I'm just so proud of you, man. <coughs> so we pulled our little, our little team of four in down there, and uh, I'm going to tell you what, man, these jokers about work me to death. Y'all hear me? I'm a preacher, uh, and, and, and they about worked me to death last week, but we sure did have a time, and your church was well represented. 
Um, so we met some interesting people while we're there. And I'm going to get into this word in just a minute. This will all flow together in just a moment. But just so you know, we met a couple whose name was Brian and, and Nellie Cavanaugh, retired couple who had been in Waverly about a year, year and a half. And they moved into this house, beautiful little home that, uh, man, just water had just destroyed it. And so you may have seen some things on the live about how they had three feet of water in, in their basement. They don't know if they're going to be able to rebuild, if it's going to be torn down. And, but, man, it was so such a blessing to be able to stand there with these folks and say, you know what, we don't know what the future for your home is, but I will tell you, you're not alone and God loves you. And it's one thing to say that to people, but when they roll up and they see tags that say Virginia on a vehicle and people have come from that far away to help them, it means something to them. They love that. They were just blown away by that. Um, we met a lady by the name of Edie. And Edie uh, will forever be known to us as Edie from the courthouse because that's how everybody in that area knows her. And we met Edie. She was standing outside of her home. And as we talked to her, she said, well, what's going on? She's crying a little bit. I'm like, what, what are you crying about? What's going on here? She said, well, I don't know if they're going to tear down my house or if we're going to have to rebuild. And if they're going to tear it down, why am I going to pull all the stuff out? So y'all don't need to help us. But my son is right around the corner at my, my parents' house. And so we went right down the corner, met her son. His name was Jared. This young man was there by himself, this old house. Y'all ever been in an old person's house that generations have lived in and ain't nobody cleaned out? Enough? I mean, it's pickles on the shelf from 1982, right? We went there, and we got the pickles off the shelf. But my brother, was he was overwhelmed, man. He was just frustrated, and you saw it in his eyes. And we were able to say to him, look, I don't know if I can, I can't help you today, but I'm going to go back to headquarters. And there's a team up there with about 800 people that, that, that we have connection with, and I think we can get a crew down here to you. Well, a couple of days later, you know who that crew was? It was us. We were there helping that, that family clean out things. Um, Y'all, I got to tell you this story. I don't know if this makes any sense or not, but, but, but my, one of the craziest things that I saw happen all week was uh, at the end of every street, the National Guard was stationed. And so you go to pull down a street, National Guard's there. So we're coming in and out of these streets, and one of the National Guard guys stops us. He says, hey, I know y'all are working down there. A lady came up to me earlier today and said, can you help me? There is a dog that has deceased and it's in my yard. And so he says to her, this lady is very disturbed because this dog has passed away and it's in her yard. He says, we can't leave our post. Is there any way you could bury that woman's dog? Tim and I kind of looked at, our, at each other and we was like, yes, we will bury the dog. Back to the thing, get the shovels. Y'all know it was 95 degrees every day last week? Y'all know that dog been laying out there in the water for about three days in 95 degree heat? So, so what does the preacher do? The preacher's over here talking to the lady about how we're going to work this thing out. I look over. Tim Warren has that dog. Y'all, if, if that dog wasn't four feet long, I mean, huge dog, he has that thing by the leg. <laughs> dragging the dog somewhere, stinkingest thing I've ever seen. But, but y'all, listen, here's the, here's the cool thing. I won't tell you about the smell and what was inside the dog. Y'all can figure that on your own. He pulls that dog over, grabs a shovel, sticks a shovel in the ground, and when he sticks a shovel in the ground, we heard click, 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 click. Look up, and there's a track hoe coming down the street. A track hoe. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like the, big, the big tracks on the thing and the big hoe. That Tim runs to that man and says, Hey! <laughs> Got that brother to come over, and with about three scoops, he dug a hole, and we took care of that situation. Won't he do it? Come on, somebody. <laughs> Y'all don't know what a blessing that was. That brother didn't have to dig a six-foot hole in 95 degrees. You know? But this, we, we saw God all around us last week. But this past week has just had me examining my own life. Like, like, like people throw out terms like hero and heroic deeds and all of those things. How many... How many times every day do we have opportunities to be heroes to the people around us? Right? Somebody, somebody just needs a hug. They don't need you to dig a hole. They don't need you to go to Texas or Tennessee or Washington. They just need a smile or a hug or a kind word. How many of those do we pass by every day? When I read the actions of Jesus, what I see is that Jesus felt the pain of the people around us. That's why I'm calling this message when I feel your pain. Jesus felt the pain of the people around him and he made time to stop and if he could help them, and by the way he could, he did. 
I wonder what we can learn from Jesus this morning. So, so if you're taking notes, write this down. Here's the first thing. It's a question. I want you to feel this question. Do I allow myself to feel those who are following me? Now, chew on that just a minute, because I don't know about you, but I know me. This is a convicting question to me. You can feel it sometimes. When How many of y'all have a needy radar in your life, right? Needy radar. Somebody needy is about to show up. Radar is going off. They're coming this way. We are looking for a back door somewhere, right? That's the needy radar. But, if, if it, but, but, but what Jesus did was he felt the pain of the people who were following him, and rather than running away from them, he went to where they were. Let's go back to this passage I just read to you, uh, verses 27 through 30 of Matthew 9. It says, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed. Everyone say followed. They followed him, calling out, have mercy on a son of David. Now, now don't pass over that phrase, son of David, because in the, in the Jewish custom, for him to be um, recognized as the son of David puts him in the lineage of a king. And these men who needed healing were recognizing and acknowledging that Jesus has the ability to do things because he's in that lineage. So they followed him. When he had gone indoors, see what happened? Jesus went, look, okay, I hear y'all, whatever, i got to go in the house. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him. They followed him, and then they came to him. Okay, y'all are following me. You're not going to go away, all right? He said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Do you believe? Man, I, I could just preach a whole sermon on that word believe because some of us, maybe you're here today and maybe you've convinced yourself that you have a relationship with God because you have said a prayer or because somebody told you if you'll just believe in Jesus. You say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. And maybe you've got yourself convinced that, that, that you're in the kingdom of God just because you believe that Jesus lived. What I said a minute ago is that belief makes its way from our, our mind to our feet. And if you truly believe in Jesus, you will follow him. I love what Penny said a minute ago. When I became a follower of Jesus, I became sold out. And what I read in the scriptures is there's not multiple kinds of followers of Jesus. There's one kind. And it's people who have died to themselves. People who are sold out. Now this passage is not really talking about salvation. But I can't, I can't gloss over that. I can't gloss, gloss over that because, because the magnificence of God, He's not trying to sell you something. He's not trying to get you to buy into something. He's showing you that God is one. He's the only one like Him. And when He comes to your life and says, I know you, I love you, will you believe me to the point that you will follow me? Have you gotten yourself there yet? Or are you just doing church? Are you just trying to be a religious person, believing the lie that if I do more good than bad that I'll make my way to heaven? No, that's not how it works. It's only the people who die to themselves and give their lives completely to God and let Jesus be the Lord that go to heaven. So when he says to these men, do you believe me? They're like, yeah, 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 we'll follow you. We know that you have the answer. We know that you have the healing. We'll go wherever you are. We will embarrass ourselves. You see what they're doing? They're following him. They're calling out. They're acknowledging. They're submitting themselves. And they're trusting in him to be able to give them the healing they look for. They came to him and he asked them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord. And again, that phrase Lord is a phrase of submission. They're, they're saying, look, I'm just, I'm just a person. I don't have any ability to fix the mess in my life. How many people who are here today have been in a place in your life where you had no ability to fix your mess and you needed a Lord to show up? Come on, somebody. Can we give Him praise for this? The Lord showed up. And you didn't have any qualms about saying, man, I'm just a worm. And I need the one that can fix things. When they replied, yes, Lord, then, see, he didn't move until he knew where their heart was. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, will it be done to you? Faith is movement. Faith is action. Faith is, is putting yourself in that place. And their sight was restored. And the thing that's so interesting to me about this, this passage of Scripture is that these men, they followed Jesus. He was going places and they followed Him. Um, uh, they, they had, they had, I'm sure they had heard that He had the ability to give sight to the blind. And so wherever they were, they had to get back to where He was. What did Jesus do? Well, he gave them what they were desperate for. 
He gave them what they're desperate for. Let's turn the tables on this a minute. Bring this back to 2021 now. Who in your life is following you and is desperate for something that you have? Are you feeling their pain? Are you, fe- are you allowing yourself to feel the people who are following you? What are you talking about, Jeff? Here's what I'm talking about. Parents in the room. Do you have a child at home that is desperately wanting your time? Think about that. There's a little kid that you come home and that kid's chasing after you and they just want you to throw a ball or play with a doll or hug them or say something to them. Yeah, I got to go cut the grass. Yeah, I got to go do this thing. Are you allowing yourself to feel those who are following you? What about a spouse? Right? Why, why do we have so much marital conflict? We, we stand in front of the preacher and we say things like, I will love you forever and I will honor you and I will cherish you. But then we, do we make time for our spouse? How many relationships are fractured and broken because two people that share the same last name are going in two completely different directions? How would your marriage change today if you allowed yourself to feel the pain of that person? What about people in your life who, who, who you've been through some things? Maybe you're a professional and you've, you, you've, you've traveled through life. What, what about the people who are, are, are trying to figure out how to get started in their career? They look at you and they see that you've been places that they haven't been yet, right? You know things they don't know yet and they're desperate for you to share some of the knowledge with. And, but are you too busy to share that knowledge and that time? What about a church that says to you, we have a group of ladies who are trying to take some time out of their life, and we want to get things going in the right direction. And Penny Pyle stands right... I just love saying Penny Pyle. It's never going to be Penny. It's going to be Penny Pyle. Penny Pyle stands right here and says, I need people that can, can read the Bible to them, that can pray with them, that can mentor them. Did you feel the pain in that story? Man, I'm so thankful for Hope Center. I'm so thankful. Y'all, can I just tell you how thankful I am to be a part of a church that, that, that goes where there's disaster? You know, I, I, see, I see Nathan Burnett back here and Dave from God's Pit Crew, and you guys gave so, so great to, to the blessing buckets a couple of weeks ago, and, and you're investing in Hope Center. And Hope Center, we're going to do better. I'm telling you, as a church, we're going to do better. But do you feel the pain when they say, we need people to come along and be mentors? Do I allow myself to feel those who are following me or do I just keep it moving? Um, I, I tend to think that, that Jesus had empathy for these guys who were following. I like, like I don't think he just, okay, yeah, I can heal you so you can get out of my way. No, I think Jesus saw these guys come in and I think in his heart, in his spirit, I think he felt the pain that they lived with every day by being blind and the struggle that they had to be able just to make it. And knowing that he could do something, he did something. What does it look like in our lives to know that I can do something and then do something? Um, I read on Facebook last night. I couldn't believe this when I read this. I read on Facebook last night, uh, someone in Waverly had posted this, that, that so, so y'all know by now from the news media reports that, that 20 people, I think that's the right number, 20 or 21, I think it was 20 people passed away in the flooding last week. Someone in Illinois read about that, contacted the funeral homes in Waverly, Tennessee, and paid for each one of those funerals of those 20 people. That's feeling it and doing something about it. They felt the pain of those people and they realized, man, they got enough going on. This is probably someone who who had the financial means to where where they could do that. I don't know. I don't want to read too much into it, but I thank God for that. My point to that is this. We can all do something. It's not always the heroic kinds of deeds. Why would somebody do that? Because they chose to allow themselves to feel the pain of that dad whose seven-month-old twin slipped out of his hands. The man had four kids. He was holding on to all four kids. The water rose. Y'all, I don't know if you know this or not, but that, that flood came so quickly. We said 17 inches in six hours. It was really more like three hours. The water came, and it rose up so quickly. It was so forceful, and then it went away again in three hours. It was gone. 
completely gone after six hours. And that water comes up and that dad's holding his four kids and he couldn't hold them all. And the two babies slipped out of his hands down the stream. First day we were there, I met a lady. She's sitting there with, with dark sunglasses on. And I'm like, ma'am, are you okay? She says, no, I'm not. Somebody beside her says she lost her sister in the flood yesterday. And she told me, she said, she just threw tears. She said, she said my sister held on as long as she could. She held as long as she could, but the water just ripped her away. And when they found her, she had her pants and her socks on. Everything else was taken away. And it just broke my heart, man. I said, ma'am, can I pray with you? She said, oh my God, please, please. I prayed with that lady. And as soon as I let go, I said, can I hug you? She grabbed me. She squeezed me. She cried. I felt her pain. You were there because you sent me. You were there in that moment because you felt her pain. And I'm just telling you this today because we're going to have opportunity after opportunity if we allow our eyes to see what's going on in front of us and our hearts to feel. But we have learned and we have developed this ability to not feel the pain and to run from it. And I'm going to tell you, you want to live a life that matters? You want purpose in your life? Yeah, it's going to hurt. It's going to break your heart. But the joy that you will receive from leaning into others' pain and giving and going, you'll never replace that. You say, how do I do that? Here's the second thing. Write this down. How can I be the person that people bring people to? Yeah, I need to read that again. How can I be the person that people bring people to? Verse 32. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute, he spoke. Now let me see y'all's eyeballs just a minute. Don't y'all be bringing me somebody that's demon-possessed. <laughs> We're going to have three people that's got a problem if you do. right? Je I, look, I am not Jesus. I am not qualified to be kicking out any demons. Maybe some of you are. If you are, I need to know so I can bring them to you. Y'all bring me somebody that's demon-possessed? Um, I don't know what to do with that. But Jesus knew exactly what to do with that. Jesus knew exactly what to do with that. But, but seriously, though, this guy was demon-possessed, and he could not talk, and, and these people knew. What did they know? They had seen Jesus operating through time, and they knew that he had already, uh, he had already uh, kicked out demons out of other people. He had already given people who did not have the ability to talk. He had given them that ability, right? So, so they knew that he had done it, and so, so they brought the man to him. Now, here's the question for you. How can I be a person that people bring people to? I know what y'all are thinking right now. Some of y'all are thinking, I don't want to be that person. I just want to do my own little thing. I just want to handle my own. I'm not trying to fix everybody's business. Yeah, 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 I hear you. I hear you. You know, I think it starts by being a people person. And I think some of us probably think, well, I'm not wired that way. Let me tell you about Edie from the courthouse. I told you about Edie from the courthouse a minute ago. Man, we, we, we met Edie from the courthouse. One of the first days we're there. Y'all ever meet somebody, Jackie Lynch? Y'all ever meet somebody who, when you meet them, you just know that this person is a people magnet. You ever met people like that? Like we met Edie from the courthouse, and she's standing there in her front yard, and there's a bunch of people around her, and she's crying, and all these people are trying to console her. We go over and talk with her a little bit. And what we find out, like, like we, our path, all these people in Waverly, people are going everywhere. People have come in from everywhere. We crossed paths with this lady like three different times while we were there. We kept running in to Edie from the courthouse. She was everywhere. And I thought about her a little bit. I thought, why is she this way? And I think it's because she's a person who allows herself, she puts herself out there to care about other people. Now, I don't know this lady. I just have gotten to know her. But here's what I can tell you. You know what I did when I got home after I met Edie from, his, from, from, from the courthouse? Yes, you do know what I did. Because you do the same thing. We get on Facebook and we stalk people, right? Come on. <laughs> I stalked me some Edie from the courthouse. I found her. I found her on Facebook, and I started looking through her posts. And y'all, what I saw on her post, I didn't see her posting things about uh, liberals or conservatives, right? I didn't see her posting things about people who get the vaccination or don't get the vaccination. What I saw her posting on her Facebook page is, y'all, 
neighbors. You're looking for help at the Presbyterian church. They're giving away everything that you need. Go there. Next post when I scroll down. It says, it says um, uh, some of y'all are looking for financial help. If you go to this church, they've got all of these agencies set up. And she named them all. She named FEMA, SBA, and, and several different ones that if you need help, go there. She put a post up. Her next post said, uh, neighbors and friends, don't forget to pay your bills. Like there's a lot going on and I forgot, I almost forgot to pay my bills. And I'm just reminding you. What does that say? It says she's thinking about the people around her. And there's a reason that she's a people person because she cares about other people. And she's using her Facebook to be something that helps the friends around her. If you want to be a person that people bring people to, you got to take the fence down. you got to take the wall down. And you have to be willing to give a little bit of yourself. Now, can I tell you something? You start giving of yourself, you're going to get hurt. You're going to get trampled on. There are going to be days that people say things about you, people will make assumptions about you, and they will hurt your feelings. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. Because you're going to have the opportunity to be a person who steps into people's lives. You're going to have the opportunity to glorify God, and as you do, He's going to bring the joy that you've never even imagined to your life. This man needed someone to cast out demons. They knew who to take him to. Someone in your life may need you. They may need you to visit them in the nursing home. Someone in your life may need you to, to, to work back here in kids' world. Somebody may need you to be the person who gives someone a hug. But when you allow yourself to do those things, people are going to see that you're a person that I can bring people to. If you say, well, I'm not naturally wired that way. What do I do about that? Leads me to my third thing. It's this question, simple question. What is my current CQ? Write those letters, CQ. What is my current CQ? If, if IQ is my intelligence quotient and EQ is my emotional quotient, then my CQ is my compassion quotient. Y'all, I, I, I walked in this morning with thoughts of everything that's been going on at our church, and I just love it. I just love it. When I tell you I'm, I'm proud that, that we have this connection with God's pit crew and there's things going on there. When I tell you that I'm proud that you guys uh, are, are doing everything you can in Waverly. When I tell you that I'm proud that you guys are pouring into a Hope Center. When I tell you that I'm proud that, that you're, you're putting this church together so that people can come and experience God. And I walk in this morning and I see these flags that say compassion on them. It doesn't say religion on them. Come on, let me say that again. The flags don't say religion on them. We are not a religious people. We are people who are striving to be like the Jesus that we follow. We learn from the master teacher, Jesus himself. Look at verse 36. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. This week I knew that I was going to be working all week long. I didn't know when I was going to have a chance to put a message. I didn't even know if I was going to be back here by Sunday. Throughout the week, I'm like, Lord, what do you want me to say to your people this week? You know what he said in my spirit all week long? When I saw the crowds, I had compassion on them. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I couldn't wait to get back to my computer so I could look up that word compassion to see what in the, in the Greek language, what, sometimes you can find like, like a word translated into English, sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't have the same oomph to it. So when I, when I looked it up, when I looked it up, the word that's translated as compassion is, is splagnitzomai. Come on, somebody. Ooh, somebody going to get set free over some splagnitzomai. I like that word. Splagnitzomai, as it explains it in the, in the, in the commentaries, <clears throat> is a word that describes having this feeling in your inward parts. Kind of like that first day Jackie Lynch walked into Frank's. Come on, I had some splagnitzomai going on. <laughs> Woo! Glory. <laughs> All kidding aside, last Sunday, that's the feeling that I had. I don't know why. Like, like, we read news stories about disasters that happen everywhere, right? But there was something inside of me, and maybe it's because we knew people who were affected by this thing in Waverly, but, but there was something in me that was saying to me, I just have to go. 
And if nobody else goes, I still have to go. I got to get there. And I got to hug some people, and I got to love some people, and I got to pray with some people, and if I can help them, I got to go. And I'm so thankful for the, those who went with us. But when Jesus looked at the crowds, he looked at the crowds. Splagnitz, oh my. He felt something stirring. This is God looking over the people. And when I look at our culture right now, when I look at our world right now, and I see Afghanistan, right? I see Haiti. Man, I was telling the band backstage a minute ago, I'm so devastated by everything that's going on in Waverly. Last Sunday, I read about, about Waverly. Today, we know that there's, there's 20 people that died in that. Do y'all know that in Haiti, just a week before this, death totals 2,200 people dead. Tens of thousands of homes. Jesus looks at this world and He has moved in His inward parts for His people who are hurting. That phrase, Christian, in the original terms when it came about, Christian meant little Christ. Meaning that, that, that the people who were following Him were to be like Him. Are we going to be like Jesus? Are we going to be little Christ? Because that's what He's called us to be. He's called us to be little Christ and He's called us to have compassion. And it's not about Waverly and it's not about Haiti. It is, but it's also about Ringgold and Brosville and Danville and our area. And I got to be honest, I don't always want to do the thing that, that comes across as the heroic thing. I don't always want to help the person that's right next to me. We all know, man, you go do something. Everybody's going, blah, 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 blah. Great job. Love it. So proud of you. What about when nobody's watching? What about when that, that single mom in front of you at the grocery store is trying to figure out how she's going to be able to pay for those groceries? And you got more money in your pocket than you need. Now, I know y'all. A lot of y'all jump right in on that and do that thing. That's being like Jesus. But I don't think we have to be heroes. I want you to look at this quote, this quote um, in Outsiders, The Story of Success. Ricky May writes, There are no heroes, just those that choose to be servants. That's what Jesus did. He served the people around Him, gave His life for mankind. And if we are to be people who are like Jesus, God knows that people who are called Christians, we... we We've given ourselves a bad name because we get dragged into the mud slinging and we get dragged into all kinds of political things and religious wars. And I don't care about that. I don't know about you, but I want to spend my life helping people. I want to spend my life pointing people to Jesus who can give them hope for their soul, who can give them hope for their spirit. And I want to spend my life doing what I can to pray with people, to encourage people. And if I can lend a hand to help them, I want to do that. And I want to lead a church that wants to do that. And I'm so thankful that that's where we're going. That's the vein that we're running in. And so if you're, if you're here and you're exploring this church, maybe you're new or maybe you're watching online and you're trying to see, is this a place I want to go? I'm just telling you, man, if you're looking for a church that has the right kind of people that look the right kind of way, it's not us. We're janky, right? Come on. Where are my janky people at? Huh? We can be a little messed up. We don't have it all together. But we're going to take our janky selves and we're going to get into some janky messes and we're going to do what we can to do something about it. So here's the question I want to ask you in closing. Actually, it's two questions. Number one, what do you do when you feel someone's pain? What's your natural response? And the second question is just this. What should you do when you feel someone's pain? Pretty simple answer. You should do what Jesus does. Jesus allows himself to feel that pain. And he invites them in. And he does what he can to help fix the problem. Now, his ability to cast out demons and to give sight to the blind and to heal those who can't speak is infinite. Mine is not. Yours is not. But if you will do what you can, if I'll do what I can, we can make a difference. Can I pray with you? Jesus, you've given us this good word today. This word that reminds us of your compassion for the crowds of people. And Lord, you're reminding us today that it is, it is 100% up to us. We are your hands and feet. We are the representation of you. And so it is up to us to go 
and to love people the way you love them. Lord, I I pray for each individual, whether online or in the room, who's listening to these words, who's, who's reading the words of Scripture that were preserved to be brought to this place on this day for these individuals. And God, I pray that you will quicken us, sharpen us, and help us to be living replications, living examples of who you are. Holy Spirit of God, make commitments inside of minds right now. Lord, I believe that you want to change things right now. I believe that you want to convict some folks who are, who are very comfortable right now in their willingness to say, I'm not getting involved in that. I think you want to tear down, tear down some walls that have been put up that are, that are saying, I'm not going to let those people in. I'm not going to let that situation affect me. God, let us tear down the walls. Let us step into situations that are are dangerous. Let us step into situations that are uncomfortable. God, let us invest our money, our time, our effort into doing things that helps the people around us. God, we know that we're never going to eradicate pain and suffering and death and evil in this world. But Lord, just like the starfish that are being thrown back, we may not be able to clean them all up. We may not be able to help them all. But God, we can make a difference to that one. I pray that you'll help us to do that. Now, while you're sitting there with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to talk about one more thing for just a moment. No one looking around. Maybe you're sitting there today. Because of where you are in life right now, maybe you identify more with the person who's blind or demon-possessed or mute. Maybe you identify more with the person who is desperately in need of Jesus. And you've not known how to get yourself to that healing. Maybe for you it's not a physical ailment, but you can sense in your soul, in your spirit, that things between you and God are not right. Maybe you've thought for a long time that I've been saved, but the Holy Spirit of God is revealing to you right now that you've just been going through religious activities. Maybe God's saying to you right now, today is your day to connect with me, to lay down your life, and let me make you new and lead you into the life that I, that I created you for. If that's you right now, I want you to know He has greater plans than you can ever imagine. And I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. Right now, in this moment, I'm giving you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. I believe there's some people in this room right now who are desperately searching and seeking for that that God has for them. You want to die to your old life, you want to be raised new. If that's you right now, and no one looking around, would you just raise your hand right now? Jeff, when you pray, would you pray that for me? Hallelujah. Raise those hands. I see those hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can put your hands down. Lord Jesus, you see these hands that are raised. You feel the hurt that's inside of the hearts that need you. So Lord, right now, we're praying. We're praying Jesus. If that's you and you just raise your hand, just just say these words to God inside your heart. You don't even have to say them out loud. God, I need you. You know my life. I give you my past. God, I know that I have sinned against you and you alone. I ask you to forgive me. And Lord, I accept your forgiveness. I accept your salvation. Lord, today, I'm choosing to die to my old life. And I'm asking you to bring me alive in you. Give me the new life. Help me to walk in you. And I'll follow you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer before you leave this building today, I want you to fill out that Next Steps card in front of you. And when you leave, either bring it down here to me on the front or take it to our Next Steps table in the lobby. Do not leave here without filling out that Next Steps card so that we can talk with you about how to take your next steps. We want to help you to move forward past today. I'm excited about what God's doing right now.